You're listening to The Adventuring Party, talking about gaming the Irish way. So, welcome to the party. Uh, I'm Zowseed. I'm on. I'm still savage. And I am the Warlord Scar. And today we're talking about uh, the person behind the curtain. Um, how being a DM is like putting on a show and how you should not reveal the secrets of how the sausage is made to your players. That's a very disturbing th- uh, theatre experience where you look behind the curtain and discover they're just making sausage in the back. <laughs> I, let me tell you about my disturbing theatre experience. So the thing I, that I found is I gathered, what was it, 23 mugs of, like, coffee with fungus grown all to the top from the rafters of a theatre I worked in once. Don't look behind the curtain the in theatres. It's scary. Rafters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. They just kept bringing mugs up there. They just kept forgetting mugs <laughs> Even where they left them. They were stuck up in girders and, like, shoved behind corners. And they was like, why do we have no mugs? So I had to go look for all of the mugs. <laughs> Um, I don't know how the sausage is made, but uh, in the spirit of revealing how the show goes on, I'm about to crack open. Yes, folks, it's it's a beer plug time. Not that we have any sponsors, but I love beer. Uh, so I'm about to crack open. I'm down home in, in the wilds of Roscommon this weekend as we're recording this sometime in Czech's calendar, August. And I'm about to crack open a, a Loch Gill Wild Irish Goose Kettle Sour Goose, which is, Ooh. I've described it in the past as a sea salt beer. And I stand by that, despite the fact that Loch Gill is not salty. It is, however, made with Loch Gill water in Sligo, uh, County Ireland, Sniffs. which is in the EU somewhere. Here we go. Oh, yeah, that's my weekend started. <laughs> OK, so I'll stop interrupting now. <laughs> What do we talk about? Uh, how the sausage is made in theatres? So in the rafters. So what I what I actually wanted to to get the learned party's views on is um, how much of how you run the show of your game do should you reveal to your players or not? Um, so the school of DMing that I come from, I guess, or that I've just grown into over the years is that you keep a lot of how you are putting, how the game is being put together behind the DM screen. Um, you, like, you have your DM screen behind it are all of your notes with your maps of whatever is going to happen and your various plot points and the like. Uh, the, you tell the players what is going on, but they, you don't tell them, like, what they missed, what was down avenues that they, they didn't get to. Like, they, they know as much as they found out in the game and, part uh, like a huge part of the experience of the game for me both as a player and a dm is the mystery of the setting unraveling it through your actions in the game and if you don't come up across certain secrets or if you don't take certain decisions you never know how they turned out and that's how the story progresses for you um the reason that i'm coming to this is that there is a uh i have seen like chatter of and and various discussions online talking about a kind of uh, radical openness of you shouldn't have a DM screen, you should have all of your notes laid out, like the player should be able to see that you are not hiding something from them, whereas I think the, you know, hiding those things is part of the point. And I've also encountered uh, interacting with DMs more recently, certainly not in the kind of first year of my play, with uh, people telling you what would have happened if you'd made alternate decisions. If you'd gone this way, this would have happened. If you'd done that, that would have happened. Here's why that NPC made those decisions. And like explaining things that your player would never have the chance to to know if you weren't given this kind of like director's cut version of what was going on. Um, so from, from my point of view, it's like that director's cut never happens. You don't tell people what they didn't find out. And in that case, it's more, the f- world feels more real because the player's experience what the, their PCs experience and their knowledge matches their, the PCs' knowledge as, as closely as possible. I was wondering, am I a complete outlier? Does that make sense to every, anyone else? What are your thoughts? What I are, think this is... Go, go ahead, go ahead, Owen. Whatever about rolling dice in the open, I wouldn't show them my notes. Because, you know, I might have a mystery to solve or something in there, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, like... It, it, people, some people get very intense about spoilers, you know? Mm-hmm. And I would say that their reaction to being told who the bad guy is 
would be similar. They would be like, this is ruined now, I can't enjoy it. So, I mean, whatever about rolling dice in the open, I can see the pros and cons of that. Uh, let the dice fall where they may, and whatever happens, happens. I mean, I keep my notes hidden because my notes have might have important stuff on them. Like, for example, the fact that somebody has a disease. I was like, yep, you got affected with that disease. That's taken up. Um, and it's a reminder for me to occasionally make you feel the symptoms of that disease. So you go, oh, I think I'm sick. I better do something about that. And yeah, like, like your notes, it is not concealing something to have your notes uh, behind a screen in the same way that, like, you're not a, the, like, a murder mystery bar Columbo isn't going to say, oh, by the way, this is the guy who did it right at the start. Uh, I'm sure this won't impact your enjoyment of the of, uh, of the following book. Yeah, like, roll dice in public, grand, shove in your notes. Well, you can do that, but I wouldn't. Yeah. For me, this is sort of a interesting... Crosswords of a couple of different player desires. One is the desire to be in that, as you say, this mystery space. This, the world is mysterious and grand. Uh, my play, my character does not know everything that's going on. Uh, thus, uh, being in that, uh, being not having the knowledge fits and will help me uh, get in the headspace and experience the world as. As my, uh, as my character says. But there's also the competing desire to say, well, why does that make sense? Can I test this world? Can I poke this and, uh, and, uh, get this? Or is it merely artifice of this mysterious g- gentleman who is definitely not my best friend behind the screen, uh, throwing random plot hooks, uh, out of, a, out of a bag of felt balls at us and just, uh, you know, are there notes? Is the world real? D- was was this guy the murderer last session, or has that been changed mm-hmm. because uh, we made a decision? Like, it's not that either of these are entirely invalid, but they're sort of at war. People are complex, and they often have contradictory thoughts about how to do things. And I, uh, the internet being the internet, I suspect that. Um, while the true answer is obviously that things are complicated and there there should be nuance, that uh, on the internet the algorithm is going to choose people who have who are taking the extreme stances. Okay, it's my turn to say inflammatory things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which part of this I hate more. <laughs> uh, is this the so uh, along with uh, Hida? I, I guess the mechanically open game yes you can see that the dice fell as they may and i, I kind of understand the players who uh, want that they're they want to they want to know that the system is working as intended and when you get to the notes though it's like uh who do i do i dislike like th- those players who are looking at that very low trust you know these mm. these are not people who like to sit with their back to a door um, they clearly have issues with the idea that anything, anything at all, might be hidden from them, or, uh, or that there might be something going on. I just, they generally just operate on the presumption that something is going on uh, that they're not being told about all the time. Um, and once we get to, well, is it, cha- you know, is it affecting the make believe? Well, everything in the game is made up. Actually, the, 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 the this is the bit I hate about what, uh, what Zausi has laid out for us. This idea that you tell players what could have happened or what should have happened or might have happened, it smacks to me of a certain cowardice, <laughs> uh, a GM living in fear of their players, that they're somehow, it, I, I guess maybe it smacks of a lack of confidence. The idea that as a GM, you need to prove to your players that, look, th- there was a plan here, or I was prepared for if something else happened. I'm a real GM, and, and this is a real game. Please, somebody, some. I've done my homework. Look, uh, it really, it really was ready. We, I knew what was going to happen. There was a, a six-fingered man. Honest. I, I sort of, I understand your revulsion for that uh, thing, and you know, it's not unreasonable to say that that is that is a, a poor DMing choice. But I sort of understand the motivation behind it, because your players want to be certain 
that their choices made a difference. They want mm-hmm. to make sure that you have a, that their what they did affected the plot, and showing them the plot that would have happened otherwise is a way to do it. The question is, is that actually a good way to do it? Yeah. So I like it assumes it assumes there's a plot to begin with. Um, well, plenty of games run with the idea that the players are the agents of change yeah. in the world. What they decide is important effectively makes up the plot. So that's going to run. That's going to run into hard problems with someone who demands that there's some sort of viable simulation of the world going on around them uh, in the GM's head that they don't necessarily have to interact with. Yeah, like, so I've got enough work to do. I think one of the things like. Or certainly a, a, a place where I can see there is an issue that this would address, though I think, again, saying that like this is, this is sledgehammer to crack a walnut stuff, is it does solve the whole, um, you know, the, there was a plot down the corridor to the north. There was like the big chamber with the ogre in it, classic quantum ogre stuff. The ch- north corridor led to the chamber with the ogre. Uh, you decided to go west. Okay, fair enough. Then suddenly the chamber with the ogre is down along the west. So the player's decisions made made no difference. The the plot was just, or whatever the walk, the content was just shifted to in front of them, whichever way. So I can see on that, like having things laid out would avoid that point of like my choices made no difference. Um, what was what the DM wanted to happen was just like steamrollers through in any case. Um, so I think it does, it does give people a sense of like, yes, their choices matter. Yes, they do have agency. There is a point to them being here and making those choices as uh, like avoiding that particular kind of railroad. However, I do think it is like, it's massive overkill. Um, the, like allowing, so, sometimes the player's decisions will bypass a whole bunch of your plot w- in a not particularly dramatic way. And I think as a DM, you have to allow that to happen. Like, um, an example from my home game, they, there was a thing that was supposed to happen ahead of a big set piece, a large noble wedding. Someone was going to, there was a conspiracy that was going to cause some trouble at that. Um, the players went around and set up a whole bunch of other f- folk, pull, pulled in some favors and set some, a whole bunch of things rolling that like nobbled that conspiracy completely off camera. So they never saw it. They just had a day where the wedding went off without a hitch. And it wasn't a particularly dramatic moment, but it was like the just reward for the choices they've made. Right. Of course, that happens in every game. The question is, do you share that with players yeah. after the fact? Uh, I well, think there's a certain passive aggressiveness there. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, oh, look, guys. I mean, if you'd done this other thing, there was all this stuff I'd prepared, but you didn't do it. So I guess I wasted my time. Like, thanks. It, let's say you've got like, there's a, a key clue to find, mm-hmm. right? And you go, cool, it's in that room. As soon as they look around that room at all, they'll find that clue. So I'm making sure the game can progress forward. And the players decide, for whatever reason, just ignore that door mm-hmm. and move past it. And you go, well, okay, until they go back, they can't find that clue, but they, they don't seem inclined to do that. So I'm just going to move that clue to the next room over, and you'll find it. You've done, ex- you've cheated in exactly the same way as the guy moving the ogre, yeah. except you've cheated to make sure your game kept going forward. So yeah. that's just good GMing. Yeah. You know, you can do it to like, I did all this prep on this bad guy, but if you did a lot of prep on a bad guy, one of the great things about RPGs is who checks your notes that much? Cause you can just go, well, oh, let me just use this guy again. You dodged him. Cool. I'll just fold him on and his identical twin brother will show up down the road. You know that that's fine. I, I, work is never wasted, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I guess it kind of loops back to the kind of my, like top line thesis of what you're attempting to do at the table is put on an enjoyable experience or help an enjoyable experience for your players happen. And it's recognizing which are the things that are pro an enjoyable experience for your players as in, hey, I put in a lot of work to this big set piece. I'm going to make sure that you, you know, run into it and it'll be good versus a uh, con, which is, um, You've wasted a bunch of time, mullet, you, you know, you've spent a bunch of time making some decisions, but I'm just like shifting the terrain ahead of you that makes all of that time that you've spent trying to figure out the right answer meaningless. Um, so, like, I think that's the kind of balance that needs to be struck. Uh, 
Right, time for a classic Savage About Face. Uh There's lots of interesting kind of cool aspects to this as well, if you kind of look at it the right way. Um, No one likes wasted effort. And Mm -hmm. as Owen says, you can often sort of have them dodge behind a hedge and come back out with a moustache on. But there are certain, as you've pointed out, as I see, there's certain aspects of of a plot or campaign that might just get lopped off in the in the cut and thrust of the edit, which is a live game. Mm-hmm. Like if you if you consider all the material prepared is now edited at the table based on what the players do, mm-hmm. then to torture this analogy further, stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. Yep. Now. As anyone who's a big cinema file knows, sometimes there's really interesting stuff there that makes it into the after credits or mm-hmm. a documentary or a you know a retrospective on on the piece. And a campaign, a good campaign of whatever length, is probably going to have a fair few trimmings on the cutting room floor by the time it's finished. And at that point, once once it's settled, I think it's a fine time for the GM to pull out the notebook and go, "You remember that guy." Mm-hmm. I remember that time you said that uh, that chancellor from uh, from the the steamboat assassins. I just want to share some stuff with you. Uh, this is something else that could have happened. You, you never you never came across the shark men, and the players like the shark men. What's he talking about? Tell me more. So there's definitely an opportunity for the sort of the director's commentary, uh, the production kind of the day the production roughs and all that to come out at some point and because it can it will i think if it's presented correctly it will enhance the player's enjoyment of the the game they have played and i have to stress this is all post post facto post gameo post ludo post ludo uh it's it's just a small bit of of that uh... dead all that Greek stuff is a good again. Yeah, well, I mean, they gave us very little to, to mull over, but we've got one or two <laughs> snippets and phrases. <laughs> so, but post uh, post Ludo, you do have another way of enjoying the game: the what ifs. Yeah. Is there any element of this that is particularly different for running RPG tables? Do we think compared to like this this approach of? Um, you know, the the you see the plot as it plays out, and then you get the commentary afterwards for like f- at the end of the plot. But is there any sort of a- anything that you would say that's different in how tables ought to be run and players and player versus PC knowledge ought to be handled? Um, I think. Go ahead. I think that monsters are a lot more scary when you don't exactly know how they work. So mm-hmm. in some games, when it's a very tactical game, having being able to suss out intimate knowledge of how a bad guy's ability works is actually key to defeating them. So being a bit more transparent about how it works or letting the players figure it out is appropriate because that's how that game works. Mm-hmm. Like if you were taking on like a lesser death in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you have to figure out how their reaction works really fast or your party's going to die. Because every time somebody takes a manipulate action within 30 feet of them, which includes a somatic component for casting a spell, they teleport behind you and hit you. And that gets re- You're like, wait, what? Like, they hit somebody, they go down. You go, okay, I'm going to try and te- uh, cure them. I cast my heal spell. They teleport behind me, hit me, and I lose my heal spell. And you're like, what was that? What the hell just happened? You just had nothing personal, kid, and also put down the cleric with a crush. So there's two people down. <laughs> what, what do we do now? How does this work? Good, scary stuff, but unless people understand how it works, they're just going to get mullered by this guy. Okay? On the other hand, if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, when you give the Shoggoth hit points, when you give the Shoggoth, explain how the Shoggoth's power works, okay, nothing does damage to it, or your bullets are doing one point of damage to it and heals five around. Players will go, okay, well, we need to back off from this fight. Whereas if you don't explain that, it's a lot scarier. They're like, oh, God, are we hurting this at all? And I'm like, eh, you know? So it depends on the game. But I know, like, if you go, somebody casts a spell in Call of Cthulhu, you can describe shriveling as you just take 1d10 points of damage. Or you can describe shriveling as the ends of your fingers start to rot and fall off and it's creeping up your hand. You know? Yikes. That makes it a lot spookier, right? Um, so, it's depending on the game, 
the amount of information you give somebody takes away some of the mystery and fear. Like if I go make a fortitude save and you go, what is it? And I go, you don't know what it is. Make a fortitude save. And then I'll start describing what's happening to you. You know, that's a lot scarier, particularly if you have, but it can be unfair in some ways if you've got meta resources yeah. like, okay, do I need to reroll this? Is this a super bad fortitude save or okay, this is just, this is just a regular bad fortitude save. Is this <clears throat> irresistible dance or is this, it will save. Is this irresistible dance or is this command? Which, which one is this? How badly do I need to make this save? I need so, to know yeah. whether it's a disease or alcohol because yeah. I am immune to those because I'm a dwarf. Yeah. What page yeah. does a GM have open? That'll mm. give you a clue. Yeah, the, the radical openness stuff is just, I'm back to being cynical savage. It's just bothering me because there is, as as Hida points out, there's so many uh, meta clues and points of information you can pick up uh, when there's no GM screen that can, I, I don't know, I suppose it, it feels like, okay, well, if your argument is that you want to make sure the GM uh, if you think that a GM screen is there to screen the GM's cheating, then what is being able to see what the GM is referring to considered from a player perspective, if not cheating? Especially if you've got a very complete knowledge of the game, uh, you read all the books, you know the system inside out, and you might go, oh, he's got the entry for fear effects open. Okay, so we can expect this, that, and the other. And I know this because I can see what he's looking at. Um, like what... What is that except metagaming at its most sort of pernicious? This uh, this low trust dynamic, I think it's fair to turn it the other way around and go, well, I can't guarantee that you're going to stick to character knowledge if you can see what's behind the GM screen. So I'm going to put one up. Gary Gygax famously ran gm-less games where you couldn't even see the gm all you could see was a screen he ran it from behind a, a full body screen so he could have had any number of, of dice and charts and and uh, voodoo dolls back there but you didn't even get to see what he was doing when you were talking was he listening to you was he consulting notes uh, all you got was the voices emanating from uh from behind the uh, the curtain so like the <laughs> it's let's let's try radical uh opacity uh, if we're going to argue for radical uh, transparency and see which one comes out on top in terms of being a play experience again I don't I feel like Owen's point is like it's going to depend an awful lot on the game and it's going to depend an awful lot on the players like some players the mystery aspect the I mysteries in general are, 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 are a tough one because some people love there is a mystery and some people love we have solved the mystery. And these are two very different flavors of very similar thoughts, but for, for someone who likes the mystery existing, um, the director's commentary on your Blade Runner is, uh, is poison to their experience. But, mm -hmm. uh, for those who want the solution to the mystery, oh, that they, they need, they, they need to tie the GM down at the end of the campaign and, and demand all of the different secrets, you know, so, Again, there's a certain aspect of reading your tables, just like, uh, like what do these people want? And very often people will make, you know, tell fibs about what they like. Cause a lot of people say, Oh, I, I want to know everything. I, 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 we must have full explanations of what happened. And then, you know, a, a year later they'll say, this movie sucks now that we know what the mystery was, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so. If you're, I feel like if you as uh, uh, as a GM truly believe in the aspect of mystery as a as a, um, a secret ingredient in your RPGs, I feel like you should be allowed to say, "I'm not explaining anything." Uh, you will just have to imagine what could have happened, what what might have been if you'd uh, killed the steamboat assassins earlier or later. Um, but you would again. You of course you want to be upfront with your players to say like I am trying to keep this mystery going, and maybe some of them will demand answers at the end. Maybe you would give them to them, but um, you know that's sort of between you. Adult conversations as always. 
The other aspect, I think, and this is coming back to where did this radical um, transparency thing come from, is I feel like that comes more from a storytelling game's perspective. And don't worry, I'm not, I'm not like poo pooing Powered by the Apocalypse or anything. But those games run with a very, the GM is just sort of another player who's who is doing setup and adding in more wrinkles, and very often each player at the table will have an awful lot of agencies uh, in their thing. It's the kind of game where, you know, a lot of players will tell you, oh, I rolled a failure and that meant I got to narrate all these horrible things that happened to my character. It was great. Um, and in that sort of context, I feel like the openness makes a lot more sense because it's about constructing your narrative and if there are hidden super double secrets... Um, often the players will won't have the correct. The players of the GM will uh, GM will not be on the right leg, wavelength to put a story together. They will be, you know, doing that thing at school where, uh, you're you're playing, you know, you're playing a, a round table storytelling game, and one player just says, and then none of that happened. It was aliens, you yeah. know. Yeah, I think that to 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 um, build on that, I think that's a. That's a key point of like, there's a very different thing happening, whether it's like, again, coming back to our theater metaphor of whether it is like a play, a structured play, there was a script, things are um, like there were elements and someone figured out the elements and then kind of people get to experience that versus uh, there's, it's like, it's completely improv and nothing has been prepared and the you know and the players have to do a lot more heavy lifting on driving the plot because if they don't do anything no plot happens so it's it like from from that point like there isn't anything behind the screen but that shoves an awful lot more out onto the players laps of like you tell me what's happening and um i i know certainly for some the the idea that like you know until i tell you what happened like there there was no mystery um, or I can just, you know, I can tell you how this thing came to pass and there's nothing to find. Like there is no, until I lift that rock and tell you what I find under it, and um, there was nothing under the rock type thing. So it's like, it's, it's, it is a particular experience and it is, I mean, it's not particular, rather. I think you need to be super clear about which one you're coming to the table to do. Um, yeah. Like uh, if even if you hide everything else, you should definitely not hide what type of game you're on. Absolutely, yes. So <laughs> I'm going to co- actually. So for so for comp- for direct comparison, um, Mick, you have played at some of my IOU tables where there was yeah. sweet all plot because we literally oh, yeah. sat down, yeah. and I would describe it as a what a very loosely guided collective bullshit session. Yeah, sort of Baron Munchausen with the with the kind of a referee yeah so so there um that was very much you know the players Good say times. what happens and it gets a little bit guided versus you've also played at some of my more like scripted things um on approach on that like you know f- for when you're doing the more open world stuff you don't need any mechanics at all because people are in and again it's coming back to scar's point about trust you're trusting people to take actions that are in that drive the story forward in a fun way without someone going like, oh yeah, and then I switch into like my my planet eater mode and solve the plot. It's like, oh well, okay, I guess we all go home now. Whoa, what was I being asked? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> it's uh, I was reflecting on the idea that our my observation would be when we were just goofing, yeah, uh, on the what was it, Illuminata University yep. or something like that. Uh, you were definitely more relaxed. Like you, you just you were, had a big yes and vibe, because as you say, we were just kind of BSing and throwing out any old thing. Uh, when it came to playing, what is it you used to run? Cathar- with Spelljammer, Catharsis, and Planescape. Planescape, yeah. Uh, I remember you were juggling some pretty big tables sometimes as well. But in the say, in the more traditional sort of tabletop that we played uh, in, say, Planescape, 
Uh, yeah, you could always tell there was lots of things moving behind the curtain, uh, and you, you're definitely a bit more stressed because I suspect there were a few more pins were getting knocked over than you would have liked on, on some occasions. But like that's, I suppose that's kind of the mode of game we, we grew up playing. We knew, um, and we didn't mind stressing you. Out. No, no real harm. Uh, you were always willing. I mean, you could always fold it in. Uh, did we need to see behind the curtain? No, I, I don't think I had any particular interest in seeing what you had planned. Not that I didn't respect, respect you'd done the work. I do recall being asked later on to do kind of handouts and things and a, a little bit of support work for other games you were running. Like, uh, was there a, uh, a ship captain's logbook or something like that? Um, and I was hugely impressed by the prep you were putting in. And I was getting the sense that the players were groxing it too because they were always excited to see a new handout or a new bit of in-world lore uh, or documentation that would that supported the the illusion that stuff's going down even when you're not looking or, or stuff's been happening previous to this that you're now learning about. Um, a lot of a lot of GMs wouldn't go to that effort. They'd say, "Oh, you found a logbook and it tells you these things." The fact that they could hold it in their hands and flip back through it and, and consult it, you know, they had, they'd have written concrete record proof, if you like, that the game is happening. Um, probably went, probably goes a long way to satisfying those people who want to want to know that there's a plan or that there's something was, you know, was happening here before we got here, without having to necessarily have everything to show them or explain everything to them like what's where you know it's a captain's logbook where's the previous year's logbook well there isn't one but you know you, you've got this one to go on and that's probably enough to satisfy most people anyone who wants to see logbooks going back seven years can go jump in the sticks <laughs> yeah the, actually that's an interesting point could you say that like handouts are that tr- uh, crossover the 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 things so, yeah. that you're handing to the players are there like concrete revelations of like this is the stuff this is what you get to see um, here's your parts of the plot that you can hold and rely on um, and none of this is going to change like this is your quantum ogre proof stuff because it's a handout you've got it what it says here is I th- gold I think they are an elegant compromise. In the, in the sense that, say you find a document that proves that uh, the dwarves did have the mining rights to that silver mine uh, in 1502 uh, by the Empire calendar. That's great. Uh, a player could very easily go, well, okay, we found this record. What other records are there? And you don't have a handout for the rest of the records. But most players will be satisfied with that because it's per- pertinent to the, the mining right dispute that the dwarves have employed them to solve. Uh, and they'll be on their way, uh, parchment in hand, very happy to have in-game, in-world proof that you can find things out and they are sort of, they're tangible. Um, like, a- again, the the, pers- the the player who might look at that sniff and go, okay, yeah, but what about the previous century's records? They can go get lost in the stacks as far as I'm concerned. There's, once you've, once you've satisfied... Once you've made that elegant compromise, I think players should know well enough to back off any further inquiries. This is the piece of information you were supposed to find, yes, but you were smart enough to discern that you should go looking for it. Let that satisfy your need for the world to be complete. Yeah, uh, There was an answer ready. It's not all the answers, and it's not answers to other questions along similar lines, but it'll have to do you. Well, um, at point on that, though, is it, it does mean that that point is now closed to player change it's like they can't say actually no yeah. uh someone else had the mining rights like no no handout says it was the dwarfs in this year dm has yeah DM has say, made... it's that kind of game yeah yeah it's that kind of game uh if you want to if you want to play like i think you'll find that most uh collaborative storytelling ter- efforts in that mode don't have a lot of handouts attached for <laughs> unless you're making them while you play that would be um, that would be impressive sorry oh like the traditional viking hat gm 
who basically is, I am the GM, I wear the Viking hat, I'm God, you'll do what I say. <laughs> you know, I make the rules, not the not some badly written uh, RPG what book with ba- secondhand art. You know, I make everything. Uh, is probably not going to, like, if they deign to give you a handout... If you go, where's the rest of them? I, I made one. You should be grateful. I, you didn't like it. I, I'm grateful I gave you that much time out of my day. Hey, one of the good and bad things about concealing so much of your stuff, if you're concealing it, is you lose out on the support network of the players. Because sometimes you're like, oh, I really need to do this. And one player goes, actually, I can do that up for you. I'm good with Photoshop. And you'd be like, oh, man, that'd be awesome. Could you? And I'll talk to you privately about that. And that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also means that when you're dealing with a really badly written module and you're sitting there going, why is there no index in this adventure? Or why doesn't the index cover this bit? Or why don't they mention that bit critical bit of information in the adventure? And you're looking through it and you're basically trying to fill time. Uh, it's good to go, guys, give me a second. Let me just figure out what this is. Or you're using a new mechanical section. And you're like, oh my God, this is dreadful. This is basically unplayable i'm very sorry whereas if you're you're always putting a, a strong front about how much you're able to talk about it you can't do that you can't let mm-hmm. them see you bleed you can never admit yeah. weakness <laughs> yeah 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 so there's good and bad there like you you get a support network oh, sorry guys this mechanic sucks uh i'll think about this see if i can come up with something different uh talk to me later you know you do, if you're always fronting you can't do that you've got to be like no it's great I love it. There's no problem. Everything about this is That's brand. not yeah. blood. You're, 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 you're st- it's victory wine, you know? <laughs> I'm just sweating excitement. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. chose to wear all red today for very for, for completely unrelated reasons. <laughs> yep. That's a great point. Oh, yeah. The, like, you, you do, yeah, you, you have to, if you're going to hold everything, then you have to, like, you have to eat the things that go wrong. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and suffer the um, suffer the ulcers for it. I uh, Heed has got a great point. Um, getting play, if I mean if if you don't want to surrender the reins, sure. Uh, and arguably, GMs should never be willing to surrender the reins. That's why they get the the best snacks. But yeah, kind of co opting your players, co opting your players uh, to c- contribute to the game outside of being outside of running their characters. Is I think is is an unalloyed good in many ways because it gives them ownership over something. I remember a GM who asked me to draw some maps and actually just transcribe really the maps that we had in our book onto a play map that we could play on. And I got the markers out and and did it uh, while the session just before the session. And I felt great pride in then we all played across that map that I'd drawn every bit of. I'd been trusted with the map and we could see everything. Uh, but I, I felt great pride, and and I was praised for it, and we had a great time. And it's it's a small thing, but it took some of his workload away. He was able to prep other parts of the game or, or shoot the the breeze uh, uh, pre-game, and we you know we had a resource that we needed to play the game better. A question on that though, like Mick, uh, so did you drawing the map remove your fun because you knew the map was coming? Oh no, not great from yeah. drawing the map. So there's some, uh, and showing off. There's definitely an element of like, um, you, like it's it's and it can be it's a gray area on like of of or there's a continuum of like of information that okay I have I have been spoiled versus um all right I know at some point we're going to be in a forest clearing. You know I still I still don't know what's going to happen there what the setup's going to be. Um, and we're down. We're, you know, we were going through a forest anyway. So okay, fine. That that makes no difference to me. You can go further. Like, I mean, the, the map is transient, but uh, a player might write a faction for you. Oh and yeah, it is. It is a gift that will keep on giving, because the player is intimately aware of what the faction's about. Some of the other players might not be. Their character might not be. And you can. I think you can trust people to to make the. The kind of the glass door distinction, but uh, they're going to be hugely invested in what that faction gets up to. Uh, you're getting a gift from them that you know that you've got serious buy-in from the player now that they've they have one thread in the weave of your world, and uh, yeah, and it makes for interesting stuff. Like good things can happen. Even and you can even fold that into stuff that you're 
uh, running from a book. You know, if there is a gap, as as Owen points out, there's a gap in the narrative, or there's a gap that's kind of obvious. Uh, you can sort of task one of your players with it. Like if we, if we want to go from like oh the open tra- very negative on this open transparency stuff because it suggests that GMs are, are are up to no good. Um, but if you want to be radically transparent, then handing over bits to the players, making them responsible. It's not good enough for them to audit your work. They're now responsible for some of the quality of the game past the running of their character and reacting to stuff. Uh, there, there's some radical transparency. You know, if you if you want to you want to get them to support the system, buy them in and uh, make them part of the problem. Yeah, I would. I would yeah, and if go. and if someone is like, oh no, I I can't look behind the screen. It will destroy my immersion. I think they will probably tell you when you ask. Like, presumably, you're not just shoving. Uh, you must. Here is the the plot for the next uh, five chapters of the adventure. You must read this and help me touch it up. I, I assume you're not doing that. I assume you're asking them, hey, would you like to help with the adventure? Uh, would you like to insert some of your backstory into this part of the campaign, etc.? Yeah. I, I, we, you can trust your players to, if you are pressing a boundary, if you are. Um, Forcing them out of the secondary world, as Tolkien and such would say, uh, presumably they will tell you and um, uh, push back and say, "No, I- I'd rather be unspoiled." And like, I feel like it's a very exceptional player that, like, if they are spoiled on one forced encounter, banded ambush, that this will destroy their immersion for the next sixty sessions of the campaign, like. Immersion can be broken, but like, I don't, I, f- I don't feel like it, it cannot be repaired. Like, so as long as you're open with what, yeah, that, that's, I think that's, guess that's where the openness should be is in, you know, what you're trying to achieve and the question, is this cool with you? I feel like that kind of openness can only yeah. improve a game. So I would, I would suggest like yeah. giving people the opportunity to kind of throw marbles onto the slope. And then have them run down the slope of the world and, you know, see where they end up, come what may. That's fine. Like, g- giving them elements and allowing them to kind of roll these elements in, that's fantastic because it, everything Savage has said about uh, buy-in and it takes world building off your hands and it gives you ideas and, like, sparks more implications and adventure hooks. It's fantastic. Um, because, uh, because as long as, as long as, like, the thing that they were, they're investigating is like, what's this faction up to? It's like, well, I wrote what that faction's up to. It's like, okay, so there's no mystery. So again, it sort of comes back to like, if there's the bits that are the mystery that, you know, what is, what is attempting to be revealed or then that's fine versus, um, what is, what is known? It's just, but it's, a, you know, what, and they might have, their motivations might be known and what they're trying to achieve might be known, but how they're getting about it and is it going to work? Is unknown, so it's it's like managing that balance between elements of the world that are known, and that can be a lot, and that's and players can help write that. That's fantastic. And then there's the elements that are unknown that are like where the game is pointed at, attempting to discover what these unknown elements are. It, it could conversely be that things are extremely known, like we know we're going to Mordor, we know we're going to have to kick in this fortress, we know we're going to have to ch- you know find a way into this mountain, chuck this ring down the thing. It might be entirely known what you're trying to do it might just be very hard and you're going to have to be extremely cunning and tactical to pull it off or split the party uh, one third of the way through and bumble around in separate adventures before having the main villain fall into the lava for you no comment I actually really like it the older I got the, the more I liked the, the Sam and Frodo bits <laughs> the, the geopolitics kind of faded in the background do we have any potatoes became very very important for me I love survival horror. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a very bleak. The the mortar chapters when I first read them as a teenager were just so bleak. It's just like this is horrible. Mm-hmm. They're going to starve to death. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, I, I I found them intensely boring, and uh, and later on kind of went back to them. And went, Actually, this is kind of this is where it lives. It's... Right. Uh, oh, caveat. Um, there was a reason I was given the map to draw. Like I know which end of a, a marker to sniff. So be careful about picking 
the player to, to task with. You don't want someone to hand you 42 pages of dry sort of functionary uh, minute for a faction. You want someone who's got a, a sense for what a game needs, preferably someone who's run a game themselves. Uh, and even then, you'd want to select someone who you think is going to write something uh, juicy or draw something good or um, come up with a good soundboard, whatever. Uh, so yeah, be careful about which player you task with which element uh, in your, your quest for collaborative openness. Step yeah. aside and let the dog see the rabbit, you know? Pick someone <laughs> pick someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, like, exactly. it, 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 if you got someone who's mechanically inclined, you want some more mechanics done, they're a great person to tap for that mm. thing. Yeah. If you've got someone who's got an artistic bent, tap them for that. Don't be like, hey, uh, we're going to move you out of your comfort zone. Uh, Owen, I want you to draw a map. And I said, but I'm terrible at art. I, it's a growth I experience. No, I, growth I did not sign up for this growth experience. I, why am I? Why this. am I doing job? It'd be like if someone decided, you know what, we're going to do for our next session. We're going to put on a talent show. I'm <laughs> like, this. This is. Where do we become a terrible company? <laughs> you know, don't sladdle people yeah. with a job they can't do or aren't able to do. You, you tap someone for something they're actually good at and you know able to, able to perform at a high level. So they're like, yeah, excellent. I'm good at that. I'll do that. You know. So, I mean, apart from the rubbernecking, is there anything to be said for, I, I, I get the, the open system play, anything to be said for sort of sitting there with a bunch of players who are potentially reading your notes upside down? That's the bit I can't really get over. What's the rationale? Well, I mean, it, it can, that game, if you're running it, is, has to be, look, I have laid out the, the day zero state. These are my notes that say, you know, who's out there. Um, and now, oh, you know, over to you guys. What are you doing? I don't have a plot prepared. What are you up to? And and they have to pick it up and run it with it. That can be done. Um, but it, if if there's like if there's other people progressing their goals, then and those are written down in your notes, and those can be read upside down. It's like, oh, look, they will. They need to be at the fountain of angels at the. With the big ring at the new moon. All right, we we go there. We plant like twenty eight claymores. Bang, solved. Like it seems to me a bit like, weirdly, uh, someone with huge trust issues, yeah. who's got. I need to know you're not cheating me. It's like I, I'm not doing it malevolently. I'm just doing it because it makes stuff more interesting. No, no, I need to know. And yeah, maybe there are some people like that, but I I don't think that should be a default assumption. Yeah, I'm finding yeah. it hard to get the mindset. Um, well, if you don't, I, I just you don't, can't put myself in those shoes. You feel the GM is cheating all the time, and like the hit points don't matter, and everything is thing. Like, show me how many hit points he has, because I feel that whatever damage I do isn't good enough. You know, he's going to fall down at four at four thing. But like, as a player, you can got to keep track of that stuff yourself and come to your own conclusions, and then maybe have a, oh no, an adult conversation with your GM about the fact that the bad guys don't fall over till round three, no matter how many hit points they have. Or how much damage they take. Round three, my god, so late. Depends. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I don't think it, the, the, the point of this is literally to show them all your notes and people check them out. It is to prove that you have notes, that, that you're not <laughs> indulging in the quantum I, ogre or well, the magical well, key room moving. Uh, moving I, I, where did I, I start feel, playing my supervisor? I want to see your work. Yeah. <laughs> if you I, I, I'm homework. running this game. I do all the prep. Who's business? Like, who's auditing <laughs> oh, yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> you want to check my homework? You can check your privilege. I yeah. I like and honestly. <laughs> I think there's yes. If it's always third round fall over, absolutely. But you probably don't need to see notes to know that's going on. Um, I, I think this map but it is, I think it's well within drawn in his head. With the IGA will hear of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's well within. Um, I think the the purview of, of a GM to sometimes to fudge to, to add another hundred hit points if you know they've got there's only twenty minutes left and we need to. I, I really don't want to do any narrative stuff after this. Like it, you're for. I suppose this point of view is lacking a dimension. It is not paying attention to some of the other mundane concerns that exist at a table. And it, GMs usually watch the clock for one or another reason. Uh, you know, Someone's got to get home. Someone's got to feed the kids. Someone's got to catch a train. Or 
hell, they they want to put on a grinder and really uh, burn through the player's uh, resources, so the character's resources, because that's kind of just an interesting thing to do on occasion. So yeah, unfortunately, there are more guards, reinforcements coming down the corridor. How many are rostered to be on today? None of your goddamn business. As many as is required to get you people to flee this encounter. The Quantum Ogre, well, or I, I, I don't have any experience with Quantum Ogres, I'll say nothing. I, yeah. I think we're, we've kind of stripped the, the veil back on this one at this point, haven't we? I think so. I think there's definitely merit to being open in certain parts of your game. This, this sounds an awful lot like a conclusion, which I'll hand over to Zouseed. No, I was. I, I think I was just going to say like so. So my my sense was like on a on a reality check of like was my thought of like this this mode of the the DM is is presenting a mystery for people to chew through, um, and that you can certainly there's room for. I think what we've teased out here is there's room for people to contribute. There's room for people to like get stuck into elements of the world building, but. There, and there is a school of play where there is the DM holds no mystery because the players are supposed to create everything that happens at the table. That's a school. Um, but the one that I'm kind of like, I've, is, is my forte where I've got most of my experience is that the DM is supposed to come up with a mystery, story, whatever for the players to try and work their way through. And on that basis, revealing from uh, the get-go what's going on and is is anathema to that type of thing. Like, the point is preserving the mystery so people have the fun of discovering the mystery. Um, but I think what we've talked through here is there's a whole bunch of different... Like, there's gradations within that and lots of ways for the players to get involved. And uh, possibly, as was highlighted, if the DM is carrying everything, the DM is carrying everything. And, you know, let go. It's not great for your stress levels. Yeah. And, you know, as it's the internet, the internet is always going to be looking for extremes and uh, attempting to sell some form of platonic ideal of a game where everything is running like clockwork, all the players are on board, GM is on board, etc. Real life happens. Like, you're... Sometimes you're going to have to fudge a plot line in the middle of it because X, Y, and Z happens. Someone doesn't show up today. You have to change the session. Who the bad guy was has to be changed so that the villain, so that the missing player's villain can show up next week. You know, that, that's just sort of stuff that happens and demanding, demanding perfect plotting and full agency at all moments of every point of the campaign is asking the world to be perfect and you know the world is very bad at that <laughs> yeah the world is very bad at being perfect okay if you are also bad at being perfect <laughs> this is terrible but if you are also you like bad to tell at being... us how we're bad at being perfect <laughs> <laughs> and and oh how we are um you can find us on Discord. You can find us at theadventuringparty.net. I don't know. Comments off there. So come to Discord. It's where we do all our business now. Uh, hell, you might get quoted in the show if you drop us a particularly pithy observation. Um, you might even join us on the show as our dear guest Zausied has today um, from all the way across the continent. Um, so yeah, listen in and send us. You can reach us at, man, I'm making a hash of this. Uh, first beer of the day. You can reach us <laughs> at party at the adventuring party dot net uh, in the form of an email. Um, and we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. We are on YouTube. Go, obviously, if even if you never listen to the show on YouTube, go and visit our YouTube page just to see our title cards, which change every week. Uh, and a great deal of, of love and attention is paid to them. And sometimes random internet searches uh, for Creative Commons images where we're <laughs> Totally above board. Speaking of creative, actually, this is all in the outro that we stick in the end of this. But the show is Creative Commons uh, version three, attribution something something. There's a more accurate version of this after this. Uh, <laughs> sometimes listen until after the the credits, where we do end uh, our snippets, outtakes, where you can see how the sausage is made, <gasps> linking us neatly back to the start. Uh, the co-hosts here are yawning, so I'm going to wrap this up. That, are we done? That was it's a long episode. Of shock, yes. not a yawn. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Oh, wait, yeah, there's, uh, there's a final part to this. Wait, if I can recall this correctly. Oh, yeah, uh, this party's over. You've been listening to The Adventure Party. We're a ragtag collective of uh, desperate souls uh, striving for truth in a world of tabletop gone mad. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can email us at party at theadventuringparty.net. Although, between you and me, the best place to track us down is Discord. Check the show notes for a link. This podcast released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike Version 3 license, which is like free, but with extra steps. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next week. And then uh, we go... Uh, so, Savage, do we actually have a post credit bit today? Uh, I hadn't thought of anything. Um, we were meant to... We really should have workshopped this. Oh, boy. Oh, this what? Actually, this impromptu is sounding false now. But, I mean, <laughs> but that is very much revealing how the sausage is made, or not. Da, da, da. <sighs> the sausage you. is made by somehow stitching different bits and flavors of sausage together across the internet. I don't... I, I don't know how we're doing it. I don't know how we're still doing it. Uh, we're at 600 episodes. No, wait, we're like we're good 100 episodes clear of the start of remote recording, I think. Ugh. And let me tell you, it's rough, man. It's <laughs> I don't know if I can do this for another year. Um, much like good role play, I think we all need get to get vaccinated. That's yeah. it. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So PSA: Get vaccinated. It's sure. Uh, PSA: get va- Absolutely, get vaccinated. But uh, do not rely on a vaccine to take us out of this one. Uh, we no, may be, we may no, be no, at no. this sometime. The numbers yeah. I'm looking. The numbers I'm looking at just indicate to me that the vaccines are probably need a six every six month booster, and we're run to a problem of we're Yikes. not getting herd immunity at. 70% or 60% of the population being vaccinated. So we're still getting spread. So that means either it is super more infectious than it was, but it's possibly also the uh, vaccine efficacy is dropping off quickly against it. So you need to be you, probably get to a rolling faster booster, which might be every three months for a bit, or might be every six months. I don't know, but I know... This is starting to sound one, like the Umbrella Corporation are winning. Are you happy yeah. for this to go in the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. You toss it out there. Fair like, enough. The, if, just sure look at the numbers. The it is, we're at, what, yeah. 70% of adults vaccinated in Ireland? And we've got, we're at the same number of cases per day and thing that we had the, the peak of the second wave in October. Same number of people in hospital, in ICU. See, you know, it's like, Hida, you're a systems guy. I'm just going to play this pandemic narratively. Fair enough. We'll see, <laughs> which, one, we'll see which one of us comes out better. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to, yeah, okay. And that, at that point, we cut. Yeah. Cut. <laughs> Let's stop recording.